Life groups are a great place to go deeper in your faith and grow in your walk with the Lord. I just love it in my life group because I get to love and be loved in community. They help you go deeper than just coming and saying hello to people at church on Sunday. If this is something that's interesting to you, please check out our website and we look forward to being in contact with you. To let it all go I see it now I'm laying it down And I know that I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon My soul needs a surgeon Son for its end.
Welcome to worship at Loya Community Church. I'm uh, Steve Murray, pastor at Loya Community Church, and delighted to have you join us for worship today. Uh, some people joined us earlier. We had a fantastic worship service out on the lawn, and you're sure welcome to join us next Sunday at 9 o'clock out on the lawn. Fantastic uh, location, wonderful uh, uh, place to do worship. So, we're starting a new series today. It's called The Good Life According to God. The good life according to God. Uh, it's a great day to start it, too. Why? Because it's Fourth of July weekend. Happy Fourth of July. Uh, we live in an amazing and an amazing country, don't we? First, a big idea of the morning is this. The United States has been a shining beacon for the good life. Would you agree? We aspire to liberty and justice, though we sometimes fall short. Well, we often fall short. It's a big problem, isn't it? Especially in the last weeks and months, we've been wrestling with some big, big issues uh, that have challenged our assumptions about who we are as a nation. Why? Why all of a sudden? Well, it's not really all of a sudden. It's always been this way. Why? That's because we're filled with imperfect people. We're a nation of imperfect people, an imperfect system. Uh, though it is one of the best systems I can think of, and I can't think of any other country I'd rather live in. But the fact is, if we're honest, there's no place on earth that is perfect. Why? Because there's imperfect people everywhere. Um, let me ask you a personal question. Are you one of them? Are you one of them? Are you one of those imperfect people? Are you willing to admit that? Have you admitted it lately? Does everybody that uh, you come in contact with understand that you know that you are an imperfect pe a person, or are you spending a lot of energy trying to convince yourself and other people that you are perfect? Uh, free people, uh, one of the things we're known for as a country, freedom. Free people, the most free people, I should say, are those who can confess their sins. Free people confess their absolute need for God's absolute grace. Why? Because they know they have a Savior. If you're not convinced you have a Savior, who accepts you just as you are, meets you right where you are, sin and all, imperfections and all. You'll never, ever be willing to confess your sins. So when we gather together for worship, we're a bunch of people gathering to say, uh, I am okay with confessing my imperfection. Why? Because I know I have a Savior, and I've come to worship Him today. In fact, I've got to say, I trust people who confess their own sins before they start accusing others of theirs. Would you agree with that? Do you have a lot more confidence in people who are in touch with their own imperfections rather than people who spend all their time pointing out the imperfections of other people? Uh, we call that uh, denial. We call that projection. We call that scapegoating when people do that. What do we call people who are able to confess their sins? Free. They're people who are truly free. In John 8, 7, uh, Jesus confronted an angry crowd of people who had, in a very really, uh, horrible, despicable way, had set up a woman uh, to do a sinful thing. Now, she made a choice, but they had set her up for it. And now they dragged this poor woman in front of uh, everybody in public. And in front of everybody, in front of Jesus, they say, okay, Jesus, apparently this woman has committed adultery, and you know that the penalty for that is death. What should we do? Of course, they're trying to embarrass Jesus. They've already embarrassed the woman. And Jesus kneels and starts riding in the dirt. He does this twice. I wonder why. Perhaps it was because when Moses first received the law of God, God, it says, wrote it with his finger. And then the prophet Jeremiah later, Jeremiah 31, tells us that God is doing a new thing, writing a new covenant Again, but he's writing it with his finger on human hearts. So perhaps Jesus was reflecting on that. But then he said, whoever is without sin, throw the first stone. It says that the crowd dissipated. People started to leave from the oldest to the youngest, the, the most mature to the least mature. Where would you have been in that crowd? I'd like to imagine that when a crowd like that comes together, when people come together to protest anything, they start with confessing their own sins. Look, I'm a, I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. It would be easy to point at me and accuse me uh, rightly of doing all kinds of things or not doing all kinds of things that I should be doing. 
But I've come to protest something because I feel strongly about it. That would be a whole different context, wouldn't it? It's not to say that we shouldn't protest or we shouldn't call out sin, but it really is important that we're in touch with our own imperfections. Otherwise, uh, we become out of control. We miss the fact that all of us need a Savior. Accusing others is easy, but it distracts us from receiving the good life. It gets in the way of the good life. Think about that. When you present yourself as superior to everybody else, it gets in the way of you or them living the good life. Accusing is easy. Confessing is hard. But confessing our sins is actually the pathway to the good life. It puts us in a position where God can minister His grace to us, convey His truth to us, correct us, restore us, encourage us, train us, discipline us, and set us on our way. Have you heard of G.K. Chesterton, one of my favorite writers? Uh, G.K. Chesterton, uh, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, uh, was a great artist, great writer, phenomenal pundit speaker uh, in Great Britain uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Anytime there was a, a need for an opinion on things, uh, they would go to G.K. Chesterton. On one occasion, the Times of London, the largest newspaper at the time, was asking the question, a time of great tumult and upheaval in Great Britain, eventually uh, uh, there's a war. But the question that they were asking everybody was this, what's wrong with the world? And they started to ask all these notable uh, people, one of whom was G.K. Chesterton. And so Chesterton's reply was this, Dear sirs, I am, sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. If somebody were to ask you, what's wrong with the world? Would you have the humility to say, I am? Start with me. You want to know why the world's not perfect? You can start right here. Uh, that's the best starting place for living the good life, don't you think? It says, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every day, every hour, every moment, I need you. I will never get over needing you. Because you make me alive. You make me strong. You give me the courage, the confidence to confess my sin and to receive your love and your grace and to stand tall and walk strong uh, in your ways. That's powerful, don't you think? That's a breathtaking thing about the good life according to God. He calls us to an attitude of humility where we're restored and set free in Christ. It isn't to humiliate us, it's to save us from humiliation. It's not to burden us, it's to set us free for the life that we were created for, the good life according to God. So when asked what's right with the world, we will likewise be able to say, I am. I am what's right with the world because I'm being reconciled to God and through His love and grace, through His truth, through His abiding presence in my life through His Holy Spirit, guided by His Word, encouraged by His people. I am being reconciled not only to myself, but to all creation. So the first point is this. The United States has been a shining beacon for the good life. The second point is this, but that's not enough. So we look to Jesus to teach us about the good life. That's the second big idea of the morning. We look to Jesus to teach us about the good life. Not just a religious life, some subset of the good life. We're talking about that is the good life. In him is the good life. He has come that we might experience the good life that we were created for. So this summer we'll be reflecting on the good life according to God. Lots of different ways. But first I have to ask you the question, well, what is it exactly? What is this good life exactly? Is it uh, available? Is it achievable? Or is it merely aspirational? The last couple of years, the most popular course at Yale University has been a course about the good life, about uh, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, right now, there are any number of fantastic books out there talking about this quest for the good life. It matters immensely to us. We can't get over the fact that we are yearning for a good life. Why? Because that's what we were created for. We were created for a good life. But it's always just out of reach as long as we try to get to it on our own terms. Even when we fulfill all those categories that we believe represent the good life, it doesn't feel like the good life. Most of us would agree that the good life would include a sense of purpose, uh, good health, security, 
Freedom, love, family, friends, fun, meaningful work, comfort, generosity, adequate income, great joy, right? Yes, of course. All those things. In fact, a person might say, well, I'm an agnostic or I'm an atheist. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't identify as a Christian and I don't need to because I understand what the good life is. That's true. Why? Everybody understands what the good life is. That's what we were created for, right? I just said that. The fact that we understand that doesn't discount Christ. It simply confirms that we were made. All things were made through Christ. And therefore, there's a, in us a sense that there is a good life to be experienced. We just don't agree on the pathway to get there. So what we present is the fact that uh, we believe that the good life is rooted in our absolute need for what God alone can provide. As we turn to Him, he leads us in a way that allows us to embrace the good life. And all of a sudden that sense of the good life is ours in spite of circumstances, in spite of lack, in spite of difficulties. You don't have to be in a perfect world to experience a good life according to the good life that God provides and that God we all want that good life, don't we? Generation to generation. We want it for ourselves. We want it for our children. We want it for our grandchildren. I want to look with you at a very profound conversation that Jesus had uh, that really speaks to this notion of the good life and how to get to it. Uh, it's in John 3, verses 1 to 21. John's Gospel, chapter 3, <clears throat> the first 21 verses. So if you have a Bible handy, pick that up and it'll open up to John chapter 3. Write it down, look it up later. And we'll dive in. So John tells us, Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Uh, if, if you're familiar at all with the Bible, you know that the Pharisees uh, were a group of people that emerged after the, the Jews came back out of exile. The second wave of exile returns to Jerusalem. They, they rebuild the temple. They rebuild the walls of the city. <clears throat> and uh, a group of people said, You know, we don't want to fall off the cliff again and be sent back into exile. Uh, we want to get it right with God. And so they committed themselves to, to being students of the law, students of his word, uh, guiding the nation into righteousness. And it's as if they said, here's the cliff we don't want to fall over. So let's build a fence. So they added more rules and conditions. And they said, that's, that's maybe too close to the cliff. Let's build another fence and another fence. So by the time of Jesus' day, the Pharisees had, had created so many conditions for fulfilling the law, that it was oppressive. Now, Nicodemus uh, was not only a Pharisee, he was a member of the ruling council, which means he was part of a group called the Sanhedrin. And that was the, the it would be like Congress. It would be like the, the, the largest leadership body in Israel. And it was a very uh, uh, great honor to be part of the Sanhedrin. It means you were articulate, you were highly connected, you're probably wealthy, highly educated. Uh, you had a great resume. So here's Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin. He came to Jesus, it says, at night. Why? Probably because he wants to avoid any controversy in relating to Jesus. Because now Jesus' ministry is starting to become a bit more public. People are hearing these stories about people being healed, miracles being done, water turned to wine, demons being cast out of people, people who can't walk being raised up, lepers being healed. And until now, Jesus has been saying to the people, no, don't talk about it. Why? Well, because they live in a very oppressive time. The Romans uh, uh, are absolutely uh, tight over Israel, wanting to control every aspect of, of people's lives. It was a police state. And so Jesus didn't want to unnecessarily draw the attention of the Romans to what he was doing just then. It was also oppressive in, in what I mentioned a moment ago. The Pharisees had so oppressed the people with laws and rules and regulations. They'd become a separate uh, elite group within Israel itself. So as a Pharisee would walk down the street, especially if you were a Pharisee dressed as a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, people would give you great deference because of their intimidation, but also because of their resentment. So uh, Nicodemus probably wants to avoid being seen with Jesus by the Romans and being seen with Jesus by Pharisees or members of the Sanhedrin. So he comes to talk to Jesus. He says, Rabbi, we know. 
that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Now, if this were a film and we had a soundtrack, when he says, <laughs> Rabbi, the music would all of a sudden come up in that way that would alert you, ooh, it's not going to go well. Because the next thing he says is, we know. We know who you are. We've got you in a very clear category. We've got you in a box. We know who you are. And you must come from God because of what you're doing. So there's something special and spiritual about you. But the implication would be, uh, this is so small that we can understand it, we figured it out. Uh, but for Jesus, that's, that's not adequate. So immediately he starts to recontextualize the conversation. And so he says, very truly I tell you, now, very truly, I tell you, is a very nice way of saying, uh, I don't think you understand anything. Uh, you've got it wrong. I'm going to correct you. You're misinformed. You're ill-informed. You're clueless. Uh, we can go on and on. Uh, if you're in a relationship with somebody uh, and you find them saying things like, very truly, I tell you, it's not going to go well. It means they're calling you out uh, on, on your lack of awareness perhaps your lack of honesty, perhaps your arrogance, that you have it all figured out. Now, I, think, I think Nicodemus uh, was a good man. The fact that he even reached out to Jesus is impressive. But the fact that he would say, we know, we know. We know what? Jesus, Jesus says to him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. What does that mean? Uh, you know, the, word, the phrase born again has become a trite cliche in our culture. It's a word that is used to mock people who say they have a personal relationship with God. Uh, it's mocked uh, here, there, and everywhere. So much so that in some ways people don't want to use the term born again because they, they feel like they immediately categorize themselves in a way that's not uh, very popular. That would be a big mistake. Because this notion of being born again is really speaking to the, the, the reality of transformation. What Jesus is saying to him is this, Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are transformed. You can't be introduced and aware and understand God's kingdom, but for God showing you. Not what it takes as a human being to penetrate that mystery. That's a very humbling thing for him to say, Nicodemus, you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm sure that Jesus said this very respectfully. But no doubt the message wasn't lost on Nicodemus because right away he responds. He says, well, how can someone be born when they're old? Let's get logical. And when people say, now I know, we know. When, they, when it turns out that they don't really know, what do they do? They start asking questions framed as, let's get logical about it. Let's get real about it. And so that's what Nicodemus is doing. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Now, obviously, Nicodemus understood how children were born. But somehow he's trying to say, you know, the logic of what you're saying is lost on me. And after all, I am a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin. Jesus answered again. <laughs> the formula is emerging. Very truly, I tell you. Perhaps you didn't hear me, Nicodemus. You certainly didn't understand me. And I don't think you're listening. Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God until they are born of water and the Spirit. Another way of saying you're born as a person, you're born as a, as a spiritual alive. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at what I'm saying, Nicodemus. You must be born again. The, bl the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, it's bigger than you. It's beyond your comprehension. Unless it's revealed to you by God himself. And this is where the conversation is going. See, we are either unaware or inattentive to God. And only God can tell us who he is, who we are, what we need, and how to get to where we want to go. Nicodemus says, how can this be? He's starting to humble himself a bit and to settle into the conversation. Well, okay, then explain it to me. We're skipping
skeptical. It's even possible. Are you kidding me? I have no category for this. How can this be? If I don't understand it, it must not exist. It must not be real. It must not be true. And this is where the good news gets really good news. When you think there is no good news and all of a sudden discover, oh my, there is good news. I just didn't know. I was the last to know. The first to admit it, perhaps, but the last one to know. Jesus says, you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. What have you been paying attention to? Certainly not the Lord or his spirit. You've been paying attention to human laws, human rules and regulations, a protective self-promoting, self-protecting stance against the Romans, against the Gentiles, against your fellow Jews. You've been so preoccupied with this, you haven't seen what God is doing. You could have said, that's why you're here tonight, because you see something and you're hungry and thirsty for it. And I'm here to tell you what it is. So he says, very truly, I tell you, We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. I've talked about things that should be commonplace and you don't seem to understand them. How in the world can I talk to you about spiritual things? A much larger, complicated category of conversation. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Now Jesus is starting to reveal who he is. He's not just an interesting man who knows a lot about God, who is an inspiring speaker. Every once in a while heals somebody or does a miracle. He is the Son of Man. He is the promised one of God, the Messiah of God coming into the world. Now, all this will emerge later, but Jesus is introducing this to Nicodemus. And he says this very interesting uh, analogy to He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. What is this about Moses lifting up a snake in the wilderness? The people, having left captivity in Egypt way back in the time of Moses, uh, you know, in the 14th century B.C., They're complaining, they're moaning, they're groaning, they're they're hostile toward God. Why have you taken us into this desolate place? Well, he's taking them on on the way to a promised land. Uh, He's taking them from slavery uh, to to sonship, right? Uh, He's treating them no longer as slaves like Pharaoh did, but as beloved sons and daughters of the Most High. But they're rebelling against him. So he sends these poisonous vipers in their midst. And these vipers start biting the people and killing them. And they're shocked. So they turn to God, and God instructs Moses to take a facsimile, uh, a sculpting of a, of a snake, and put it on a wooden cross. And every time somebody, and hold that cross with the snake up, and every time a person is bit, and they look at the snake on the cross, the cursed snake, they would be healed. The curse of being bitten is now going to be healed by looking at the cursed snake on the cross. It's a bizarre, bizarre event in Soria. It sounds like the pagan people around them, not the people who believe in the one God. And yet all of a sudden it starts to come clear. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, taking the sins of the world upon himself, him himself becoming the curse. As we see the curse of this man on the cross, this this cursed man taking the curse of humanity, all the sins of humanity on the cross, being crucified, dying for us, we, we too are healed. But all of a sudden this dense, bizarre story is revealed as part of God's plan to redeem all creation. It's not a pagan ritual at all. It's the promise of God being fulfilled. Clearly we need a guide. And more than a guide and an example, we need a Savior. And once we embrace Jesus as our Savior, He does become our guide and our example. Again, empowered through the Holy Spirit, informed by his word, encouraged by his people. Jesus goes on to say, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, which begins now. Life now lived in the context of time and space, but eternal life meaning we will live beyond time and space. There's life after life.
So he says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world already stands condemned. None of us are perfect, remember? None of us is perfect. The most perfect nation ever devised by uh, humankind is grossly imperfect. We know that. The best nation is one we live in, in many people's opinion, and it doesn't compare to the kingdom of God. And that's true of every human nation, our best efforts. And there's something beautiful, uh, and God's at work in every culture and every nation. But all of them fall short, right? The world stands condemned already. Not much of a case to be made. So God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. So Jesus comes not as the accuser, but as the savior. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. The good news is that we can now stop hiding and we can start abiding. We can confess our absolute need for his absolute grace. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Which category do you want to be in? Which direction do you want to be going? It's not about perfection. It's about salvation. So he finally, uh, he says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. As long as they hold on to this idea that either I'm perfect or I want to pretend and represent that I am, we'll always be afraid of the light because it exposes us. That's why free people say, I want to go into the light. I want to receive the light. That's why after his repentance from adultery with Bathsheba, David in Psalm 51 says, hey, Lord, shine your light on me, lest there be any, any unholy thing in me. Cleanse me, purify me, transform me. This is, the, this is the statement and the posture of free people. I confess, I need you. Why hide? Why pretend? And so whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they've done has been done in the sight of God. That's scary close, wouldn't you say? Being so scary close to somebody that they know who you are. They know your heart. It said that you're really close with somebody, not when you just know what makes them laugh, but when you also know what makes them cry. You know what moves a person deeply? You really know that person. They trust you enough not to abuse that or take advantage of that. Powerful expression a deep, deep friendship. So that brings us to the third point. If, if the United States is awesome, a beacon set on a hill, but it's not enough, and we need to go to the second point, that we learn the good life through Jesus, then the third point is this. The conversation went where Nicodemus never expected it to go, and that's true for us. As we enter into this conversation with Jesus about who he is, what he came to do, who we are, and why we need what he alone can bring. That's a conversation that takes us places we never expected to go, either because we didn't think it was possible or because we would have never wanted to go into that conversation. Jesus wasn't who Nicodemus expected him to be. He was more and better. Jesus is not who we expect him to be. He's more and better. This is a familiar pattern for anyone who takes Jesus seriously, and I hope that describes you as a person who takes Jesus seriously. Either as a person who already believes in him, and is wrestling with the implications of that, or somebody who's saying, I don't know if I believe in him or not. I think I used to believe in him, but I don't think I believe in him anymore. And you have all these reasons. Bring those reasons, bring that place where you are to Jesus, whether you know him or, or not. And he meets you right there and takes you where you want to go into the good life. How so? He reveals who you are and what you need. He reveals who he is and what he can do. Not as a transaction, but as a transformational relationship with the living God. God's love, grace, and truth consistently surprises us. We discover He's good, but He's not predictable. He responds to us as His beloved children, but we can't control Him or coerce Him. We cannot manipulate or exploit Him. He's good, but He's not predictable. And yet we will experience the good life as we walk with God and dream big with Him. Not dream as in fantasize, I wish my life was perfect. 
But as we dream with him, as we say, Lord, what is it that you want to do in me, in us, in this world? Where is it going? And as we deeply study his word, deeply meditate and reflect on his word, open ourselves to his Holy Spirit to inspire and instruct. As we enter into community with beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, we start to see all the possibilities of dreaming big with God. Being big together about what he wants to do in and through us. Not in some way that it is bringing glory to ourselves. Self-aggrandizement. Oh, we're awesome. You should be like us. But rather saying, isn't it great what God does in people who are yielded to him? He, he works right where they are, and sometimes that's where they stay. But he works powerfully within them where they are. Sometimes he, he works where they are and then takes them where they never thought they would go. In any case, this is what we experience as we experience a good life, walking with God and dreaming big with Him. I want to invite you on behalf of uh, our board and our staff uh, to read a book with us this summer and to watch a film series with us this summer. The book is called Dream Big by Bob Goff. Uh, it's a powerful book. It's a very thoughtful book. Uh, right now, coming into this week, it's number three on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, Bob is a dear friend of of our, of our congregation, of us personally, and uh, uh, we're going to really enjoy, we are really enjoying uh, reading this book want you to read it with us this summer as we reflect on the good life. And then we want you to watch a, a brilliant film series, uh, eight episodes, uh, called The Chosen. Uh, if you haven't read the Read, Think, Pray that we sent out uh, this week, we send one out every week to set you up for the sermon. Uh, there's there's uh, content in there that will allow you to connect to The Chosen, but if you want, just look up The Chosen, download the app, uh, you have free access to these eight episodes. Brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, filmmaking about Jesus. Uh, best I've ever seen, for sure. Uh, so we want you to be part of that conversation as we reflect together over this summer on what it means to experience the good life according to God. And right now, uh, it's, it's Communion Sunday. We celebrated Communion earlier this morning, and hopefully you can celebrate it at home, whether you're on your own or with other people. Um, if you have it now, uh, let's, let's celebrate it. If, if you don't, uh, celebrate it af after you watch this sermon. But Jesus, on that night that he was betrayed after a very long meal, the Last Supper with his disciples, uh, informing them, teaching them, instructing them about what was to come, encouraging them, I took bread and having blessed it, he broke it saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup and having blessed it, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me whenever you do this. This tells us and reminds us, instructs us and inspires us that Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf on the cross means that we have life forever in him. As I said earlier, no one, no thing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. By the simple confession uh, of your lips saying, Lord, I believe in you. I receive you. I welcome you into my life. You become a friend. And the joke goes that as we constantly do that, it's like we're born again, 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 again. Um, the fact is we're being renewed and continually transformed. And Holy Communion uh, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, uh, reinforces that and confirms that every time we gather together to take that. So now uh, I want to pray for you and uh, commit you to the Lord and commit us together as we have this uh, wonderful conversation this summer about the good life according to God. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your abiding presence, your abundant grace, your incredibly wonderful mercy and compassion. We thank you, Lord, for your patience with us. We thank you, Lord, for your tenderness. So, Lord, I pray for me, for my family, for this congregation, uh, that as we open our hearts and minds to you, as we open our hands to you, uh, this will be a season uh, of true refreshment, true restoration, true renewal, and true revival. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, one thing also I want to say before I offer you a benediction is this. Uh, please let us know how we can pray for you. We literally pray for every prayer request every week. And then as you see answers to the prayer, uh, partial or complete answers to the prayer requests that you give us, let us know because we love to thank God for answers to prayer as well. 
Uh, if you want to contribute to, to support this church and make our ministry possible, uh, please uh, follow the instructions online and, and do that or send us uh, 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 whatever gift God puts in your heart. Uh, we, we, we thrive on prayer. We thrive on the generosity of God's people. Why? Because we thrive in Him together as we experience a good life. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon us all, His face shining on us every day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you on this wonderful Independence Day, 4th of July weekend. Mm -hmm.